Hi, it's Katrina. From stealing $80 million worth of diamonds to drilling a tunnel under a bank vault, here are eight of the craziest heists of all time. Number 8. Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum Heist in the early morning hours of March 8, 1990, two men disguised as police officers approached security guards at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, Massachusetts. They claimed to be responding to a call. They must have been pretty convincing because the security guards made the grave mistake of buying the imposter's story and were attacked and tied up as soon as the men gained entry. For the next hour, the thieves systematically gathered 13 valuable pieces of artwork amounting to around $500 million in what became known as the largest ever recorded theft of private property. The hall included masterpieces by historically renowned artists such as Degas, Manet, and Rembrandt. One of Vermeer's 34 known works, The Concert, was also stolen. In the early 2000s, the stolen paintings were offered for sale in Philadelphia, leading authorities to believe that the thieves were members of a criminal organization with roots in the mid-Atlantic states or New England. No arrests have been made and the paintings were never recovered, despite the efforts of both the FBI and internationally launched investigations. Boston gangster Bobby Donati and a Hartford, Connecticut gangster named Robert Gentile have both been suspected of involvement in the heist. But these leads are unlikely to go anywhere as Donati was murdered the year after the heist and Gentile denies any knowledge about it. The empty frames remain on the walls of the museum in honor of the stolen works and as reminders of their hopeful return. A reward of $5 million was offered by the museum for information leading to the recovery of the artwork, and in 2017, this reward was doubled to $10 million. So if you have any leads, call the FBI. Number 7. The Collar Bomb Bank Robbery one afternoon in August 2003, a pizza delivery man named Brian Wells entered a PNC bank in Erie, Pennsylvania, and calmly handed a note to a teller as he pulled down his t-shirt to reveal an explosive device around his neck. The note demanded $250,000 or the place was going to blow. He left the bank minutes later with around $9,000 in cash. Right after, he was confronted and handcuffed by state troopers and admitted to being the PNC bank robber. Wells claimed that he'd been attacked by a group of black men who attached the bomb to his body and forced him to rob the bank, and he repeatedly warned the troopers that the bomb would soon explode. Unsure of what else to do, law enforcement kept a safe distance. The device began beeping. Ten seconds later, it detonated and Wells was killed. In Wells' car, investigators found detailed instructions for a macabre scavenger hunt that would supposedly lead him to the keys and combination codes for unlocking the bomb. It was later determined, however, that Wells would have never had enough time to follow the instructions and release the device's four locks before it exploded. Investigators were baffled by the bizarre tragedy. A month later, a local man named William Rothstein told police about a dead body in his freezer. The body belonged to a man named James Roden, who Rothstein claimed was killed by his ex fiance Marjorie Deal Armstrong. When Deal Armstrong was arrested for this seemingly unrelated crime, she implicated both herself and Rothstein in what became known as the Collar Bomb Heist. A fellow inmate later reported that Deal Armstrong had confessed to murdering Rodin because he knew about the collar bomb plot and threatened to turn her in. She had also confessed that Rothstein had helped her build the bomb and that her motives were purely financial. On the day of the heist, Deal Armstrong and a group of co-conspirators lured Wells to a remote location by ordering a pizza. Wells tried to escape when he realized he was in danger but was outnumbered by the criminals. And, well, we know what happened next. It was later determined that Wells was likely involved in the initial planning stages of the heist, but became an unwilling participant somewhere along the line. His family adamantly denies this allegation. That's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this truly strange crime, but I have more crazy heists to tell you about. For a more in-depth look, check out the Netflix docuseries Evil Genius. And now for one of the biggest mysteries ever. But first, if you are new here, welcome! And be sure to subscribe, we'd love to have you around here! Number 6. D.B. Cooper On November 24, 1971, a mysterious man in a business suit, identifying himself as Dan Cooper, approached the Northwest Orient counter at Portland International Airport and paid cash for a one-way flight ticket to Seattle. 
Shortly after takeoff, he handed a note to flight attendant Florence Schaffner, who was seated in a nearby jump seat. The note stated that the man had a bomb in his briefcase. He opened his briefcase just wide enough for her to see eight red cylinders with some wires attached to them. Cooper then demanded $200,000 in cash, four parachutes, and the immediate refueling of the aircraft upon its arrival to Seattle. Schaffner informed the cockpit crew of the ransom demands, and pilot William Scott contacted air traffic control at the Seattle-Tacoma airport, who then reached out to local and federal authorities. For the next two hours, while the 36 other passengers were told that the flight was delayed due to a minor mechanical difficulty, police and FBI prepared the parachutes and ransom money as the aircraft circled around Puget Sound. Schaffner later described the hijacker's demeanor as polite and calm. Another flight attendant, Tina McLeod, gave a similar report, stating he seemed rather rather nice. He was never cruel or nasty. He was thoughtful and calm all the time. When the ransom and parachutes were finally delivered, the passengers and all but four crew members were removed from the plane. Cooper instructed the cockpit crew to fly to Mexico City at an altitude of 10,000 feet and at the minimum possible speed of 185 miles per hour, and to keep the cabin unpressurized and the landing gear deployed. They agreed on Reno, Nevada as a refueling point. At 7.40 p.m., the plane took off with four employees aboard who were instructed by Cooper to remain in the cockpit. Meanwhile, five military planes trailed the aircraft. Shortly after 8 p.m., as the plane was en route to Reno, Cooper opened the plane's rear entrance and jumped out. His departure was not witnessed by anyone. Subsequent ground and submarine searches repeatedly led to dead ends. The serial numbers on the ransom money were published several times, but turned up no useful leads. Numerous theories about Cooper's identity and whereabouts emerged, but none were deemed credible. The FBI closed the case in 2016, and it will only be reopened if physical evidence related to the case is produced. Earlier this year, 84-year-old author Carl Lauren published a memoir about a longtime friend whom he claims was the real D.B. Cooper, a former military paratrooper and intelligence operative named Walter R. Rica. But Rica died in 2014, and because the case is closed and Lauren failed to produce physical evidence tied to it, the claim remains uninvestigated. Number 5. The Vastberga Helicopter Robbery Swedish police were confronted with the country's first ever helicopter robbery in September of 2009 when a stolen Bell 206, occupied by a crew of three or four bandits, landed atop a cash depot building. The thieves used sledgehammers to break through a reinforced glass window and used explosives to blow through security doors. They raided the cash vaults and loaded an unknown amount of money into the helicopter. Police were on the scene shortly after the thieves arrived, but due to the suspected use of submachine guns, they didn't intervene. Another 10 minutes later, the helicopter left the scene with the robbers and loot aboard. The sophistication of the Vastberga helicopter robbery isn't limited to the use of a stolen helicopter. Before the robbery, the roads around the building were outfitted with caltrops, anti-personnel devices containing sharp nails, to prevent police cars from accessing the vicinity, and decoy bombs were placed at a nearby police helicopter base. The abandoned helicopter was found hours later in a forest north of Stockholm. Although the thieves executed the robbery with precision and skill that most criminals are incapable of, they were apparently less crafty when it came to concealing their identities. Seven men between the ages of 21 and 36 were quickly arrested in connection with the crime and were given sentences ranging from one to seven years imprisonment. Number 4. The Pink Panther Robberies Meet the Pink Panthers, the most successful gang of jewelry thieves in history. The International Crime Network contains somewhere between 200 and 250 members and has committed at least 380 armed robberies since 1999. Most of the Pink Panthers are from the Balkan states, and their crimes span several countries including Japan, United Arab Emirates, Switzerland, France, the United States, Australia, the list goes on and on. Over the years, they've stolen gold and diamonds to the suspected tune of at least $500 million. The gang is known for their meticulous planning and their creative disguises, having dressed as Hawaiian tourists, laborers, and women. They are very creative. They're also famous for their ability to make off with millions of dollars worth of stolen jewelry in just a minute or two. Their equally clever getaway methods include the use of bicycles, speedboats, and scooters, just to name a few, which is good when you're robbing Harry Winston. In 2008, the thieves took off with 80 million euros worth of jewelry. 
One of the most famous heists by the Pink Panthers was in 2007, when two stolen Audi A8s crashed through the glass facade of the Wafi Mall. In all the chaos, the members stole $4 million worth of jewelry in minutes. In a 2010 interview with The Guardian's Havana Marking, a member known only as Novak stated, We scare people, but we do not hurt them. We only take expensive things from rich people. Why are they called the Pink Panthers, you ask? Because in their early days, they stole a diamond hidden in a jar of face cream, inspired by the film The Return of the Pink Panther. They get many of their ideas from movies and detective novels. Although the gang remains at large, the diligent efforts of law enforcement agencies in various countries have led to numerous successful arrests in recent years. Number 3. The Great Train Robbery In August 1963, under the leadership of an infamous burglar named Bruce Reynolds, a group of 15 armed robbers wearing ski masks, helmets and gloves brought the Glasgow-London Royal Mail train to a halt by tampering with a nearby train signal. The train's engineer suffered a blow to the head, but the fireman, who was also captured, was unharmed. The bandits had received sensitive schedule and train cargo information from an insider, leading to the theft of 2.6 million pounds, the modern-day equivalent of 48 million pounds. Normally, the mail train was not carrying that much money, but this was right after a bank holiday weekend. The majority of the passengers never even knew what happened. They loaded the money into trucks and transported it to a farm hideaway provided by another anonymous accomplice. The inside man who leaked the information was a mystery for many years, but recently it was revealed that it was Patrick McKenna, a post office worker from Belfast. Using the stolen cash, the thieves played a game of Monopoly, because what else are you supposed to do when you're waiting for things to cool down? Then they hired six men to burn the farmhouse down, but the job was poorly done and police uncovered an abundance of fingerprints at the scene. Thanks to the sloppy work of their hired help, 12 of the bandits were arrested and sent to prison. Number 2. The French Bank Vault Tunnelers In Paris in 2010, a gang of thieves broke into a vault of a Credit Lyonnais bank branch using pickaxes and flamethrowers to drill through the 32-inch thick wall from a neighboring cellar. The bank's security guard was held hostage for nine hours as they rummaged through 200 safe deposit boxes. Before fleeing, the bandits freed the guard and set fire to the vault in an effort to cover their tracks. The total of the stolen cash and valuables was estimated at 22 million pounds, but the victim's losses weren't just monetary. One customer, Christian Julian, had used his box to store his wife's rare African jewels, which possessed a great deal of sentimental value. Another victim, Michael Barnich, had his two boxes emptied of his family's prized gems. He blamed the heist at least partially on the bank's alleged insufficient security. Although the incident bore uncanny resemblances to several similar robberies that occurred throughout France that year, some of which were foiled by alarms, the criminals were never caught. Number 1. Banco Central Robbery This next tie sounds like something straight out of a movie and even earned a Guinness Book of World Records title. In 2005, a group of men posing as a landscaping company rented a property a few blocks from the Banco Central in Fortaleza, Brazil, the central bank. They spent the next three months patiently digging a 256-foot-long underground tunnel from their office to the bank. Thanks to a tip from a bank employee, they broke through nearly four feet of steel-reinforced concrete and into the bank's vault without triggering any sensors or alarms. They stole five containers filled with over $70 million worth of reals and weighing over 7,000 pounds. And they almost got away with it. The discovery of a fingerprint at the scene, along with red flags raised by the cash purchase of 10 cars the next day by one of the men, led police to the suspects. Around three dozen men were ultimately accused of being involved. And while a few escaped unscathed, 26 of them ended up in jail. I think that's a lot of people trying to pull off a heist. However, only $8 million of the stolen funds were ever recovered, probably because they spent it so fast. Thanks for watching, and don't get any crazy ideas. Be sure to subscribe before you leave, and I'll see you next time. Bye!